vote for the Democrat in November. Um, and what are your thoughts about a Democrat that might also come from that big in their kind of philosophy? Because we do have that last minute entry, and that's what some people are afraid that there might be two billionaires going against each other, and I'm not too yeah, sure that how I feel I'm, about that. I'm not a fan, but again, if Bloomberg is the nominee, I will vote for him. I probably won't work for him. If 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 Warren or Sanders is the nominee, I'll work hard for them. But I I, I doubt that I would work hard for Biden or or for Bloomberg. I doubt that I'd work at all for them, but I will vote for them because you got to, you know, right now, tomorrow, I have the opportunity to vote for the greater good. But in November, it may be the lesser evil. It was last time. I, I did vote for Hillary. Um, wasn't all that happy about it, but I did it. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to vote for candidates that we may not be all that pleased with, but we are definitely not that pleased with the alternative. So if, that, if the alternative is going to yeah. be but, but you as know, disastrous as Ahead, we have options on that, too. I don't, I don't understand why we still don't have ranked choice voting. I don't understand why we still have the Electoral College. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that, that, that could shift that would really change the dynamics here. If we had had ranked choice voting in 2016, we would never have had President Donald Trump. We might have had President Ted Cruz, which would have not been great, but we would not have had Trump. And we might have had a President Clinton or a President Sanders. Uh, and for those that are not familiar with that term, and I'm not altogether that familiar with the term, what does what is that term mean, and what is what is what is that? I know a lot of people are not fans of the electoral college, and I'm not a fan of that either because I think that we've lost a couple of elections in the popular vote. The candidate that won didn't really win because the electoral yeah, exactly. college said that somebody else won. Yeah, and those were very very bad administrations, both of them. But um, ranked choice is the idea that when you vote. You shouldn't have to, quote, throw away your vote because, like, okay, let's say tomorrow I'm faced with a choice between Warren and Sanders, whose politics are fairly similar. Their personalities are rather different. But what they actually stand for isn't that different. And now with Klobuchar and Buttigieg out of the race, um, the people who want a more conservative version of the Democrats, um, a centrist version, really their only choice is Biden left. So... What would happen, what, and people, my Bernie friends are telling me, don't vote for Warren tomorrow because you'll end up helping to elect Biden. But I don't think that we're at that stage yet, and I'm not following their advice. But, you know, in if this was the general election, right now, if you, let's just say that you've got, let's say, a 70% majority in favor of, of progressive politics. So you, And let's say that both Warren and Sanders each get about 35% of the vote. Okay, that's the 70. Um, and then you've got another 30 that's going to go for, um, for Biden. And let's say, if, and okay, so one of the progressives is going to win with that eking out, but not really a clear mandate. Okay, if it's only 60% and the moderates get 40%, then Biden wins even though he doesn't represent the whole population or even the majority. But if you have ranked choice voting, I can say, okay, my first choice is Warren, my second choice is Sanders. And if neither of them get a majority, then they go and look and see who has the least number of votes. That person is out, and then their votes are distributed. So if... Uh, let's just say that I voted for Warren as my number one and she's eliminated, uh, my vote goes to Bernie and it's not thrown away. Hmm. I still like this idea. Um, but then again, I'm also a fan of, but some people say that it's not that great of an idea because it's more open to cheating, but I can also see the benefit of uh, how do you cheat? internet. I don't, of, I don't of, think of, you... of, uh, no, not, not the ranked choice voting, but of internet voting, because I think that that's the way that we can get closer to the better percentage of voting. voting. I, 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 I'm not, I, I agree that Internet voting is, is far too hackable, and I also think that the Democrats should have pushed through mandatory, hand-countable paper ballots years ago when they had the mm. chance in 2009. And I think if we had hand-countable paper ballots, we would have had very different election results in at least three of the last five presidential elections. And uh, those ballots should be counted by hand. And, uh, you know, I don't understand why we need to have the results announced 10 minutes after the polls close. Take the time, yeah. count the votes, have monitors there to make sure they're being counted accurately, and have a fair election and have something that can't be hacked. 
But do you ever think that we will move to a point where we will have some sort of, maybe not Internet voting, but some sort of voting that is a little bit um, more public, for lack of a better term? And it may not be the Internet, but something that we might. gets there's, more there's people engaged. There's a whole engaged. lot of electoral reforms I'd like to see. Um, and, you know, but ranked choice is something that's been used for 70 years in Cambridge, Massachusetts. San Francisco started using it recently. Um, a, a number of places, New York City, I think, just um, instituted it in certain elections. So it's, it's a movement that's beginning. And that's when I think we can win. Yeah, that sounds like that would definitely improve the situation and it might even get more people to vote. Because I know that I'm oftentimes disappointed, particularly in these off-year elections, even though we all know and we can say until we're blue in the face that the majority of the decisions that are important to us, meaning the decisions that impact us on a regular basis, are at the local and the state level. But we do get caught up in the presidential politics and things of that nature. So we get a little bit of a bump in the four-year elections, and a lot of times the two-year elections, not as much because people are not necessarily finding the benefit of knowing who their sole commissioner is and the mayor and some of the other yeah, offices, exactly. even though at the end of the day, they're the ones that make the decisions that impact us the most. Yeah. My, my wife ran for a small town position. Um, was it only last year? My goodness. I think it was last year. It might've been two years. No, it was two years ago. Um, and you know, in our town votes, very progressive in national and state elections. But the local, those people do not come out for a small local election of who's going to be on your select board and who's going to be your town moderator. And we were not able to pull out the votes that we needed and um, got stuck with uh, with the incumbent who we were not happy with. But that's the way it goes. Anyway, um, that, we've, we've gone way off the topic here, haven't we? Yeah, we, we did go off the topic. I'm going to get back to the topic. I'm sorry. We did go – Sidetrack there by a little bit of the politics, but we'll come back to the things that are going on with who are some of the other businesses along the um, – you mentioned a couple of, but who are some of the other businesses that you felt have done a great job in terms of being proponents of this kind of green movement here in the, uh, the U.S. and just out there? We've named a couple of them, but I just wanted there are some other examples that you would let folks know about that um, you've been a big-time supporter of. Okay, I love a company called Dean's Beans. It's a coffee roaster in Orange, Massachusetts. I actually know the owner. Uh, he was back when I had a radio show. He was a guest on mine twice. I think he was on one of only three guests that I had more than once. And um, every bean that they have roasted since he opened the doors of the company in 1993. Every single bean has been organic and fair trade. And incidentally, he used to be a labor lawyer, and he got into coffee as a way of doing social change. So his company was from the get-go built around social change. And then he takes portions of the profits, and not only does he give it back to the coffee communities, but he funds village-led development projects. So the people in the coffee village decide what they need, whether it's a well or a school or a training in um, nonviolence for men who have been abusing their partners, whatever it is that they decide they want. He funds it and sets it up to run it, and then he gets them running their own show. So it's not, you know, a great white father coming in paternalistically to say, here, I'm going to run this NGO for you, and I'm not really going to think about the consequences of the local economy. But it's really, okay, this is what we need as a village, and this man who is uh, not ashamed to be profiting from uh, the coffee that we are growing is giving back to us, some of what he has taken so that we can fund the things we really need in the town and run them ourselves. And I think that's a great model. You do see sometimes that, that charities have very unintended consequences. I think about whether anybody asked I, – I have a lot of respect for Tom's Shoes, uh, which gives a pair of shoes out every time anybody buys one. But I do wonder how much market analysis they did of what is going to be the impact on people who make shoes locally when they do that. And everything is related, as we know. <laughs> so sometimes things that seem simple are not simple, but the other, the flip side of that is that sometimes things that seem way too complicated turn out to be quite simple indeed. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, you're right, a lot of times we don't think about the consequences of what that action might mean. I was wondering, um, I know that you also were a big supporter, at least I saw that you mentioned a couple of times, LED lights. I was just wondering if you explained to me why you think that those are very good on an environmental standpoint. I know that 
Cree, which is based here in North Carolina, was a big supporter of LED lights. But um, I was just wondering, from an environmental standpoint, why you think LED lights are a good um, buy? Okay. Well, first of all, LED lights use something like one seventh of the energy of incandescent bulbs. They use. Uh, we all know about compact fluorescents. Those are the ones that look like corkscrews, and they were mm-hmm. a great innovation. And they they cut down the energy use by about 60%, 70%. And then LED lights cut that again in about a half. So it's it's using really just a, a tiny little trickle. I have LED lights throughout my house, and they're wonderful. It used to be they had terrible quality light, but now they're really good. So that's one thing. And then uh, you talked about D-Light, <clears throat> which is a company that has gone into developing countries and sold LED solar-powered lanterns to people who've been using kerosene. Now, Mark, let me tell you a thing or two about kerosene lamps. Mm-hmm. First, we talked already about the need to get off fossil fuels. Kerosene's a fossil fuel. It's polluting. Right. It gives off toxic fumes. It's highly flammable. And if you're living in a little hut in, let's just say, Rwanda, and you're using a kerosene lamp and you actually set your house on fire, you have a fairly good chance of dying or being seriously injured. So the LED eliminates the fire risk. Um, it has a better quality of light, and what that means is that let's just say that people have been working all day, they put in a 10-hour day farming, and then they come home, and they can see well. So maybe they do a little cottage industry making, I don't know, bracelets or something that they can then use to lift themselves out of poverty. Meanwhile, their kids can see by the light to do better on their homework and get better grades and eventually better jobs. And the person who sold them the light and is servicing it for them has a job and is able to uh, to lift themselves out. So you have this, this virtuous ripple effect where everything is making everything else better. Uh, so instead of the vicious circle, you have a virtuous circle. So this little uh, – and oh, I should mention that many of these companies are selling these on time payments. So they figure out what you were paying for your kerosene. Let's say it's $2 a month and your family income is $25 a month. So a little less than 10% of your money has been going for fuel for your kerosene light. When you switch to the solar one, that fuel cost goes away, but you still have to pay for the light. So let's say they say, okay, the same $2 you've been paying, we'll take that for 10 months, and then you're done. You own the lamp free and clear. And you have 10% more disposable income and better light and no toxicity and no fire hazard. Hmm. Wow. Um, I talk that, about that, that extensively in, in, uh, in Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World, by the way. I, I go into some detail on that with, with numbers of how the impact was of one company's doing this. No, and that's definitely what we need to see is more companies doing that kind of work. Now, I was wondering, how do you feel that our education system is doing in terms of teaching these kind of green philosophies? I know that we do a really good job of teaching kids, particularly in this day of gig economies, that, you know, going into business is a wonderful thing. And I'm thinking about friends of mine that do things like Dash and Uber, and that's just two examples of uh, gig jobs. I mean, there's all kinds of gig jobs out there. But I sometimes wonder if both on the grade school level and on the college level, if we're doing any kind of good job in terms of teaching these kind of green philosophies in terms of it being a good um, way of doing business. And if if there are good colleges that are doing this, I imagine it probably like Antioch, because Antioch's a liberal college, might do a really good <laughs> job of, of doing these of doing these kind of things. I'm, but, I'm Antioch uh, class of 77. And I have some friends that graduated from Antioch, so I'm imagining that they probably do some good things like that. I went to Marquette, and it's a Jesuit school, so they may have some business kind of acumen in terms of these kind of things. But I imagine that a lot of our colleges and definitely a lot of our um, grade schools are not doing that great a job of teaching these kind of thoughts. So I'm just wondering how, as you're going around the nation and even the world, talking to people about becoming more green aware as you are being an entrepreneur, how we're doing in terms of educating our greater public. Well, I think actually the business schools have gotten a lot better about this in the last 10 years or so, 15 years or so. Um, I go to a lot of conferences. They they all have tables there. My wife just retired from teaching at the business school at University of Massachusetts, and that's an enormous state university with like 40,000, 5,000 students, and they have a very green campus. They actually have a permaculture farm 
on the campus supplying many of the vegetables. Their dining halls win awards for their good food. I used to 